Ambassador O'Brien, standing room only. Um, on behalf of the Atlantic Council, welcome to you all. My name is Frederick Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and we're delighted to have you all with us this evening. Uh, tonight's a, a special evening, not only because we've got the National Security Advisor here, but also because this is hosted by our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, named for the only person to have served two presidents as National Security Advisor General Brent Scowcroft. Some would argue he actually served three in that he was Deputy National Security Advisor to uh, President Nixon at a time when uh, uh, Henry Kissinger was both Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. Um, Henry Kissinger might quibble with that description. When we launched the Scowcroft Center in 2012, uh, our goal was to honor General Scowcroft's legacy of service and give the work the same sort of ethos that guided him selfless, principled, uh, patriotic ethos that guided him throughout his career. Since the center's creation nearly eight years ago, we've infused General Scowcroft's legacy with cutting edge strategy work, which runs deep throughout the center, and in fact, the wider Atlantic Council, both regionally and functionally. Less known, is his commitment to mentorship and bringing along future generations of leaders. Uh, and we have tried to continue that work here as well. While General Scowcroft's legacy has shaped the Atlantic Council, it has without a doubt left an indelible mark on the role of the National Security Advisor as well as the wider National Security Council. While at the NSC, General Scowcroft implemented a new model from his position as Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. In fact, in his biography of General Scowcroft, author Bartholomew Sparrow refers to him as a man who, quote, never lost sight of his goal of managing the NSC process as effectively as possible and rarely ignored the lessons of history and the longer term interests of the United States. As such, it is our particular honor to pass the microphone to former National Security Advisor and Atlantic Council Vice Chair Steve Hadley one of the many people who gained so much from working with General Scowcroft, and it's an even greater uh, honor to pass to him to introduce uh, the current uh, assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, Ambassador Robert O. O'Brien. The most important thing, of course, one has to say in these, these settings is please follow us on Twitter, uh, at Atlantic Council, at Atlantic Council, and at, at A.C. Scowcroft to join this special conversation. Steve, the podium is yours. Thank you, Fred. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce tonight Ambassador Robert O'Brien. Robert O'Brien is the 28th U.S. National Security Advisor taking office on September 18, 2019, after a distinguished legal career in private practice, as well as a remarkable public career. He was born in Los Angeles and was raised in Santa Rosa, California. He received a BA in political science from the University of California, Los Angeles in 1988, and a JD from the UC Berkeley School of Law in 1991. While in private law practice, he was the California managing partner of Aaron Fox LLP, a distinguished national law firm, for seven years. During that time, he grew the California offices of the firm from 10 attorneys to more than 110. He was then a founding partner, along with former federal judge Stephen Larson of the Los Angeles law firm Larson O'Brien LLP, which they established in January of 2016. He served as a major in the Judge Advocates General Corps of the U.S. Army Reserve. Mr. O'Brien has had an equally distinguished public career, serving in appointed positions during the Clinton, Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations. From 1996 to 1998, Robert was a legal officer with the United Nations Compensation Commission in Geneva, Switzerland, which reviewed and processed claims from Iraq's 1990-1991 invasion and occupation of Kuwait. He was nominated by President George W. Bush as the U.S. Alternative Representative to the 60th Session of the United Nations General Assembly during 2005 to 2006. 
He addressed the General Assembly on the question of Palestine and represented the United States in the General Assembly's Sixth Committee, which considered the Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism. Mr. O'Brien served as co-chairman of the U.S. Department of State's Public-Private Partnership for Justice Reform in Afghanistan, launched in December of 2007, which promoted the rule of law in Afghanistan in training judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys. He continued in this role during the first term of the Obama administration. From May 25, 2018 to October 3, 2019, Mr. O'Brien served as the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs. He helped secure the 2018 release of American pastor Andrew Brunson, and as of the end of 2019, 22 American hostages held overseas had been released during the Trump administration. Even critics such as Peter Bergen concede that when it comes to freeing American hostages, the Trump administration has a good story to tell. Robert O'Brien is an important part of that good story. He is well prepared for the job as national security advisor, the best foreign policy job in government, bar none. <laughs> but I may be president, prejudiced. He's also one of the most challenging, and, and we are fortunate to have Robert with us tonight to tell us about it. After initial remarks from him, we will move straight to a fireside chat moderate, moderated by Margaret Brennan, moderator of Face the Nation and senior foreign affairs correspondent for NBC News. Robert. CBS, CBS News. Ah! Oh. <laughs> CBS News. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen. O only my mom would uh, would actually believe the uh, introduction, so it, uh, that was kind of you. And, and Fred, uh, what, what an honor it is to be here at the Atlantic Council and, and the Scowcroft Center, so uh, it's Scowcroft Institute. So, so thank you for having me, uh, Margaret. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I think Margaret was the first uh, broadcast journalist to join me in the uh, in the new office over at the White House uh, this past fall to come talk and talk foreign policy and. We think of her as an anchor uh, on Sundays, and she's a great anchor, but she's also uh, uh, very wise and knowledgeable when it comes to international relations and foreign policy. Uh, I can't tell you how honored I am to be here at a uh, institute named after General Scowcroft. Uh, he's certainly uh, one of the most distinguished individuals to serve as the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs uh, under two presidents, as, as Stephen uh, mentioned earlier. I admired General Scowcroft Sco uh, long before uh, having this job, and, uh, and my respect for his, his dignity, his wisdom, uh, uh, and, and his skill at uh, the job has only uh, grown during the, uh, the last five months that I've, I've sat in his chair. So I, tonight I, I bring you greetings from President Trump, and uh, I thought what I would do is offer uh, a few comments uh, before uh, uh, Margaret grills me on uh, what, how I, I view the Scowcroft model. Uh, at the NSC. And I, I've been very honored to receive advice and, and counsel from a number of my predecessors. Uh, Stephen's been, uh, uh, been one of those, uh, a, as well as a number of chiefs of staff, and, and those are our predecessors and chiefs of staff from, from both parties who have been, uh, and, and, uh, and, and various administrations who've been very kind in, in extending their time and their talents to, to give me their thoughts. And the one thing that would come up in each of those conversations would be the Scowcroft model, and uh, we ought to follow the Scowcroft model. So to, to get to that, to understand the, the NSA, it, it's uh, the, the National Security Council and, and the, the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs occupies a unique structure in the American uh, foreign policy and national security uh, apparatus uh, architecture. We, we don't have, I don't have a cabinet department uh, to, uh, to execute and to, to run operations. We don't run intelligence operations. We don't order troops uh, uh, into battle. Uh, we don't send, uh, for the most part, uh, diplomats out to uh, engage in, in diplomatic uh, initiatives. Uh, what we do have is we have the power to convene and we have proximity uh, to the president. And uh, I think what General Scowcroft uh, would say is that uh, 
it's important for the National Security Advisor to recognize uh, in light of that, uh, in light of our place in the ecosphere, uh, what the role of the National Security Advisor is. So <clears throat> my view of this, and I, th I think this follows in, uh, in General Scrocroft's uh, uh, tradition, is, is that it's not our position or my position to be an advocate for one policy uh, or another, uh, and not, not to seek a particular policy outcome. It's to ensure that the president is well served by the cabinet departments and agencies in obtaining counsel and formulating his policies. And then those policies are decided by the president. And once the policies are, once the president's made his policy decisions, that they're faithfully executed. Uh, certainly as a national security advisor, uh, I'll give the president advice when he asks for it. Uh, but, you know, that, 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 that role is really, uh, that, that advice is secondary to the role of being the honest broker, to, to get the president the opinions, the counsel, uh, the recommendations of his cabinet secretaries and agency heads, uh, and, and, and to ensure that there are good policy outcomes as a result of uh, the briefings that, that the president's received. It make, it's very difficult to do, to, to undertake that role and, and to be seen as an honest arbitrator uh, or a, uh, uh, a faithful messenger uh, if, if we articulate as, as a national security advisor a strong policy preference at the outset, uh, even if we, if we do have one. Uh, and th those, th uh, those policy recommendations for the most part are reserved for uh, the president after hearing from uh, the other members of the administration. So fulfilling this role in a modern world requires an NSC staff that uh, uh, will lead a policy process that's consistent with the president's vision and pursuit of, of his objectives. Uh, while the vast majority of the uh, NSC staff are detailed from other departments and agencies, that when they, they come to the White House, they serve as the president's personal staff. And, and it's our view that while they're at the NSC, uh, they should represent not, not represent the views of their parent agencies or departments. They're not there as liaison officers. And they certainly shouldn't represent their own personal views. Uh, what they are there to do is to ensure that the interagency function uh, interagency process functions properly, effectively, and the president has to have confidence in the folks on his staff, to, uh, on his NSC staff, to ensure that they're committed to executing the agenda that he was elected by the American people to deliver. The size and the, uh, the scope of the uh, and role of the NSC staff has changed over the years. Uh, it's uh, been 70 years from, uh, I'm gonna give a couple of uh, examples, 12 staffers supported President Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, there were approximately 35 policy professionals under President Carter. Uh, that grew to about 100 under President Bush, in the, President George W. Bush, uh, uh, Bush 43, in, in the first term. And, and those 100 policy staffers were dealing with uh, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the global war on terror, uh, and everything else that, uh, that, that's on the plate of the, the president. When I assumed office, uh, and, and under President Obama, that staff grew to about 240 policy professionals. And, and so when I talk about the, the policy professionals, I'm not talking about the folks that operate uh, the White House Situation Room Wizard, uh, or that handle the computers, or the technical staff at the White House that, that uh, report up through the NSC, but the policy staffers. Uh, when I took office, there were over 175 policy staffers, uh, and in, in uh, discussing this with my colleagues, uh, with predecessors, with the president, we felt that a, a policy staff that was similar in size to the staff that staffed President George W. Bush in the first term uh, was, was the appropriate number uh, for us. So that, that was a, uh, a number that could be, be well managed uh, and, and would deliver the president what he needed uh, w without the bloat and inefficiency that, that can sometimes seep in. Uh, the other thing is it, it, it there, we, we did not view a, it as necessary in this administration to recreate a mini State Department, a mini Pentagon, a mini Department of Homeland Security over in the uh, Eisenhower building, the old Executive Office building. So we've proceeded with the right sizing for the most part. Uh, that's, uh, that streamlining and right sizing is concluded. Uh, I think we're down to uh, around 115 to 120 staffers or will be by the, uh, the end of this week. And we think that that number is consistent with uh, the policies of prior Republican administrations. 
While we've been doing this right sizing, though, we've also felt that it was important to make sure that we got process right. And so uh, in five months, we've had over 60 principal and deputy committee meetings. Uh, the Trump NSC operates under National Security Presidential Memorandum 4, or NSPM 4, which de defines the process by which policy is coordinated through the NSC at the various levels and ultimately to, a pre to the President for his decision. Uh, our team has sought to safeguard and enhance the policy process outlined in NSPM 4. Uh, this is the essence of serving as an honest broker as defined by General Scowcroft. Moving to the President's desk, well vetted and thoroughly debated policy options and advice for the President's consideration. Uh, my organization, the reorganization of the NSC, though, has not occurred in a vacuum. Uh, the United States has entered into an era of prolonged peacetime competition with great powers, China and Russia. The President's 2017 national security strategy makes clear the administration's priorities and the need for a national security architecture capable of meeting the challenges ahead. A streamlined, efficient NSC staff is required to succeed at this generational undertaking. Uh, since announcing the organizational changes of the NSC in October, I've been pleased uh, by the responses from people with knowledge of the NSC process, including some of my or most of my predecessors. Uh, I'll mention what uh, felt good to, to, to get this accolade, not for me, but for the team that is, that's been working on this, but one of, uh, uh, one of our career ambassadors who served at the NSC during the Carter years said that if nothing else happens during uh, our team's tenure at the NSC, uh, reforming the NSC, bringing process back and getting the NSC back to a manageable size uh, that, that's efficient uh, will make the, the, uh, the tenure at the NSC a success, and, and I give my, uh, my team and staff credit for that. I believe that many of the administration's successes uh, that have taken place during the last three years, but uh, especially over the last five months, demonstrate the efficacy of the changes that we've made. We were able to do these while reorganizing the NSC. Uh, we, the President uh, unveiled his vision for Middle East peace, which is the most serious, realistic, and detailed plan ever presented, one that could make the Israelis, Palestinians, and the region safer and more prosperous in a once-in-a-generation genera opportunity to bring peace to the Holy Land. Uh, the President took decisive action against the Iranian Quds Force and its leader. America's military and our coalition partners have destroyed the ISIS territorial caliphate and the President ordered a bold uh, joint force special, opera special operations uh, mission to bring to justice uh, the leader of uh, ISIS, uh, Bakir al-Baghdadi. Uh, and I thought one of the, uh, in, a, in, a, in a polarized time and a, a polarized uh, town, uh, at the State of the Union when the President introduced uh, Carl and, and, uh, and Marsha Mueller and, and, and Carl Mueller stood up with a picture of his beautiful uh, daughter, Kayla, uh, and announced uh, and declassified announced that the uh, the team that executed the raid uh, gave the ta task force uh, the uh, numerical uh, uh, vi version of, of Kayla's birthday. Uh, there was a standing ovation from both sides of the aisle from from our military leaders. Uh, it was a special moment, and I think uh, all of us will remember that that night that uh, the justice was brought to Al Baghdadi for the journalists who are out there who. Think of Jim Foley and uh, and and then uh, humanitarian workers Kasich and Sotloff and Mueller and and all the others who were butchered by uh, Baghdadi. That was a a special night. And it was a it was I was proud to be part of the team, president's team in that operation. President Trump's pulled us out of the JCPOA with Iran and rallied a regional coalition uh, to deter Iran's nuclear ambitions and support for global terrorism with a maximum pressure campaign that we're starting to see bear fruits. Our team under the President's leadership has successfully encouraged NATO allies to do what every President since Jimmy Carter has, has asked, and that's to substantially increase defense spending. Uh, NATO allies other than the United States have increased defense spending by over $120 billion over the past three years, and by 2024 that number will be $400 billion. The U.S. withdrew from the ineffective uh, INF Treaty, uh, which combined with the President's new investments in uh, d the Defense uh, Department may bring Russia and even China to the negotiating table for serious discussions on nuclear arms reductions in the coming months. President Trump ended sequestration for defense spending and has begun rebuilding the U.S. military and is, is moving forward with his commitment to a 355-ship Navy, modern Air Force, and an Army and Marine Corps equipped for today's challenges. These are just some of the President's accomplishments achieved largely through his conviction that America's best days are ahead, that we are on the cusp of a second American century. 
President Trump's belief in peace through strength, like Ronald Reagan, has guided America through this difficult time and dangerous world. I strongly believe that the National Security Advisor, whoever he or she may be, plays a unique role in our security apparatus, along with our NSC staff, and working with the President, we're especially empowered to implement his agenda and advance American interests through a serious, well-developed policy process. I'm privileged to serve as the current custodian of, of this great organization and carry forth the legacy of General Scowcroft and the many exceptional men and women who have served as the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. Thank you for having me today, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you for those remarks. Um, before we get started, I do want to say we will open this up for questions and um, some hopefully illuminating answers uh, after we finish our conversation here on stage. I do want to ask you all, though, to indulge us a little bit by not immediately getting out of your seat at the conclusion uh, so that the National Security Advisor can depart safely and swiftly uh, before all of us rush for the door. So if you would remain seated until he and his team depart. That would be greatly appreciated. And with that, um, you know, one of the things that's challenging in being a moderator is not figuring out what questions to ask, but certainly with you, which questions you can possibly squeeze in to the amount of time that we have here. Um, because there are a million and one policy questions, and I also want to ask you about the restructuring, as you said, the right sizing of the National Security Council. So let's start there. You said the number would get to about 115 to 120 staff. You'll be there, you think, by the end of this week. One of the concerns people have when they hear things like changing process or the Scowcroft model, they'd certainly cheer, but they wonder, how do you reconcile that with the Trump model, um, which often is seen as not having process and perhaps favoring political appointees over professionals. In your version of the NSC, how are you thinking of that? Because you know, at the forefront of everyone's mind, is the departure on Friday of Alexander Vindman and his brother from the National Security Council. And so right from the get-go, this is being looked at with questions of political bias. Well, so it's a good question, Margaret. One of the things we did, and I wrote an article or an op-ed in the Washington Post when I first took the position uh, back in October, and laid out what we were going to do. And, and this was a plan that we had from the start. We've executed the plan. Uh, I think we've had about 70 folks rotate out of the NSC. Uh, for the most part, they do not lose their jobs. These are career officials that, get, that are detailed to the NSC, and they go back uh, to their home agency. And, and what, what we hope is that they'll take the skills and experience and capabilities that they develop at the White House and take them back to the Department of State, and Department of Defense, and Homeland mm -hmm. Security. And that they'll do a great job there, and they'll, they'll be better. Uh, they'll, they'll be better bureaucrats, better officials, better better soldiers, better diplomats uh, in their home agencies after they've spent some time in the White House. Uh, it's really a privilege to work at the White House. It's it's not a right, and because of our uh, limited budget, uh, uh, unlike so my my cabinet colleagues, uh, uh, we have a, a very very small budget. Uh, so we rely on detailees. Uh, now, as we reduce the number of detailees. The percentage of political uh, hires uh, increases, but it's it's relatively marginal. The number, generally, the number of, of political appointees there won't increase in number; uh, mm -hmm. they'll just increase uh, slightly in percentage. Uh, but we're we're relatively limited by our budget on uh, on how many political folks we can hire. Now, I personally believe that the the the, the way we've handled the the reduction was the uh, was the right way to do it, and and. That this was very different than what President Kennedy did. When President Kennedy took office, uh, he had about 70 uh, NSC staffers that President Eisenhower had assembled. Uh, he let them all go immediately, and he brought in 12 political uh, uh, confidants and staffers and people he had trust in, and, and had a much smaller NSC after having uh, uh, released the folks from service who were who were there at the time under the Eisenhower administration. So, I think what we we decided to do is is let folks uh, detail uh, uh, finish up now. Uh, everyone who, who is left, I believe, has been there longer than a year, some longer than two years. And his term was ending in July, or scheduled to, so yeah, his so departure <coughs> is early, as is that of his brother. Yeah, so, so, so the Vindmans had been there for, for had, been pa had, had served a detail over a year, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was just time for them to, to go back, and, and their 
uh, their services were no longer needed, and, uh, and so they've gone back to the Department of the Army, and, uh, and so that's where they'll, they'll continue their career. So will there still be a National Security Council director for European Affairs, or has Alexander Vindman's job been completely eliminated? No, uh, look, all of the, the uh, departments, all the directorates have gotten smaller as a result of this. We've consolidated several uh, directorates. Uh, we've reduced the size of several directorates. Uh, we will have a director for European Affairs. Uh, the acting head of that is Tom Williams, a PhD, fa fantastic guy. Uh, we've got some excellent staffers uh, in the directorate, so we are not planning on, uh, on ending the European directorate, and we'll have folks looking after uh, all of our interests and all of the countries in, the, in that region, and, and we'll have a, we, we have a great team there, so, and so we're excited about uh, working with them on a going-forward basis. And I just want to bun it up, because when you were with me in November, and we talked a long time ago about your, your vision for streamlining. That was well telegraphed. But with the timing of what has just happened with the conclusion of impeachment, the fact that Vindman and his brother Yevgeny, who was an ethics lawyer on the National Security Council, were both fired on Friday and walked out. Yes. It sounds like the thing you said you wouldn't do, which is to retaliate. Can you answer that specifically? Oh, I, oh, Can you I, say unequivocally yeah, it wasn't that? No, look, absolutely. And uh, so, so number one, uh, they weren't fired. Uh, so none of the detailees that leave the NSC are fired. Uh, folks may think it, that you know it feels that way, and look, it's great to work at the White House. Everybody likes working at the White House, uh, but there there will come a time for all of us who work at the White House, including me, uh, that we'll leave the White House. And, and as far as being walked out, that's standard procedure. And, and folks who who worked at the White House know this: your last day, you lose your badge, and someone walks you out to the uh, uh, to the gate. And so, and that happens when you're at the White House as a visitor. You have an, an escort uh, who escorts you out. People don't kind of free range in the. Mm -hmm in the White House, and, and if you don't have a badge to open the gate, somebody has to let the Secret Service know and they let you out. So uh, I, I just wouldn't read anything to that. But, but look, at the end of the day, the President is entitled to staffers uh, that, that want to execute his policy that he has confidence in, and, uh, and I think every, every President's entitled to that. Uh, but, but there's no, no, absolutely no retaliation with respect to the Vindemans as far as, as impeachment goes, but the President is entitled to a staff that he has confidence in and that he believes will execute his policies. I mean, look, we, we are not a, a country where, where a group of lieutenant colonels can get together and dictate what the policy of the United States is. The mm -hmm. policy of the United States is, uh, is, is formulated and decided by an elected president of the United States. We're not some banana republic where lieutenant colonels get together and decide what the policy is, is or should be. Is that what you're be. suggesting happened? No, I'm just, I'm just saying that we're, we're not that country. So the president's right. entitled to a staff of people that he has confidence in. Sure, I just, because there is so much, uh, certainly online, certainly being uh, speculated um, about the Vindmans themselves, and you know, the br brother Yevgeny was also fired, with an, was an ethics lawyer. I assume you will still have those on the National Security Council too. Um, I hope so. but, uh, um, but to that point, can you directly say that they were not retaliated oh, against? I, I can absolutely tell you they were not retaliated against. Did the president no. ever tell you to get rid of them? Because he spoke publicly and named them. You don't normally yeah. hear the names uh, of National Security uh, Council uh, members. Uh, absolutely not. The, the, the hiring and, and uh, the, the decisions with respect to our personnel are made by the National Security Council. Uh, with our, the, the, ultimately, the buck stops with me, but we have a chief of staff, we have uh, a deputy, and we have lawyers who are involved in every one of those decisions. And so the, 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 those were my decisions, and I stand by them, and, and, and we're very proud of what we've done so far. There's also um, a bit of a whisper campaign about somebody else who may w have worked um, for you. And I was wondering if you could address that because the president's attorneys are talking publicly on television, uh, saying they know who Anonymous is, this person who wrote this op-ed, and that that's part of the cleaning house. And those terms, cleaning house, clash with what you're saying was a planned restructuring. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> so th th this town is amazing when it comes to whispers and, uh, and who knows what. So I don't know who Anonymous is. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I've heard from reporters. I haven't heard from the President's lawyers. In fact, I, I talked to the President's lawyers and, and well, I, I have not Joe heard. Joe on TV. Well, I, like, I, 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 okay, let me say, it's the White House lawyers, okay, official government lawyers. I haven't heard from any lawyer who Anonymous is. Uh, I think writing Anonymous is inconsistent with working at the White House or working at the NSC, so uh, whoever wrote anonymous, uh, you know, probably shouldn't be there. I mean, it's a breach of confidentiality, even if there's, and I don't know if there's classified information in the book. I haven't read it. I haven't read the op-ed. Uh, so, you know, I think that's inconsistent with 
your duties as a as, as someone you know, working in the White House. Uh, I don't know who that person is. I don't know the Whisper campaigns and. Uh, and you don't know if that person's still there at the White House. I, I don't know if Anonymous is still there. I mean, you would probably have better insight on, into that than I would. Uh, but, Do you see uh, how many journalists are in this uh, room? They all want to yeah, know so for uh, what you think. Well, yeah, so <laughs> I'm sure that whoever gets that, that'll, that'll, be, a, that'll be a good scoop for you. But uh, I, I don't know who Anonymous is. Okay. Um, we will get to questioning. So I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be more questions on that topic as well coming your way. I want to move on to China. The coronavirus, you were on Face the Nation recently talking about this and your desire to get American officials and American experts on the ground in China to evaluate what the reality is. There are now over a thousand deaths. Where did this virus come from? Do we know anything more? We don't, and uh, we don't know where it came from. Uh, we, we know where it originated. Uh, we don't know how it originated. Uh, there are various theories that are, that are floating around out there, but we don't know. Uh, we do not have American doctors uh, on the ground. The WHO, I believe, has a new team in, but that, that team does not include American doctors. Uh, we have offered that. Uh, we've offered the Chinese the, uh, uh, the opportunity to have American doctors from CDC and, and NIH and, and other experts uh, come to China to help them. Uh, that, that offer has not been accepted at this point, but that's a, an outstanding offer. Uh, but there's much that we don't know about this virus, and, and you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, this is an you know this is a very serious uh, situation. It's extraordinarily serious in uh, China. The numbers are growing, both of infected and of uh, of deaths uh, on a daily basis by by uh, extraordinarily large numbers. We're fortunate so far in the U.S. I think we're at 13 confirmed cases, and I don't believe anyone has died in the U.S. as a result of the the new coronavirus. But it's a it's a real concern, and that's why we took steps early on. I think there there was some criticism of the president uh, when he. Uh, uh, put uh, restrictions in on travel on folks traveling from China or on folks who've been in China, non-American citizens who've been in China within the last 14 days. Uh, but we felt that was an important measure to take to uh, safeguard the interest, uh, safeguard the health of the American people. And I think that's being borne out. But having said that, this is a uh, uh, th this is a tough situation, and, and these global uh, epidemics and pandemics can spread very quickly. And, and we're we're monitoring it extraordinarily closely. Because they're so little known or made public, it's led to a lot of theories of the case. Is there any chance that what like Senator Tom Cotton has publicly said at hearings is the truth, that some of this was a biological weapon, that this wasn't just something that came from animals? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've seen those, those reports, and, and uh, Twitter and the Internet are, are alive with them. I don't have any information on that one way or the other, uh, so, so we just don't know. I can't, I can't comment on that. Okay. Yeah, he brought it up at but a talk, but hearing Senator, Senator last Cotton, week. Senator Cotton is a, uh, so I said this about all senators, you know, very smart, handsome, uh, uh, intelligent senator, and uh, uh, he's actually, uh, Senator Cotton's a friend of mine, and, and, and he's been watching this, this very closely. I have not seen the full amount of uh, the full testimony, but uh, he's a smart guy when it comes to these issues, and he's a, he's a leader when it comes to national defense and, and national security issues, so he's certainly someone worth, uh, worth tracking, but I, I, I don't have have that information. The, um, the fact that our two economies are so intertwined means that whatever hit China is going to be taking will have some kind of impact on the United States as well. Um, most directly, perhaps, in this phase one trade deal that President Trump uh, recently completed that had promises that China would be able to make agricultural pur purchases. You've already heard from Larry Kudlow that the timing of that may have to shift. What will this do um, to what the president has already tried to put together in a trade deal, and what kind of economic impact have you sort of been able to back of the envelope project? Yeah, that's, that's another great question. I mean, one of the things we're, we're in a very fortunate situation right now because the American economy, I, I don't think, at least in my lifetime, has ever been stronger. We are in a very, very good position. Uh, with the U.S. economy, but and, and so we're able to weather some of these these storms, whether it's the virus, the Boeing situation, the GM strike, uh, better than we would have otherwise been. So we're in a great. The president has put us in a great position. Deregulate, deregulation, tax cuts, uh, you know, uh, incur the co consumer confidence, encouraging Americans to go out and start businesses, getting folks off the welfare rolls. Uh, we, we've we're, we're in a very good situation because of the president's economic uh, policies and the team that he's put in place. Uh, but there are, you know, look, look, this, this could have an impact uh, on the phase one deal. It, it's not going to change the phase one deal. It's just we, we expect that as part of the phase one deal, 
uh, China will expend more money on U.S. agricultural products, uh, and we'll have to see how that plays out. Now, one of the other things that China is battling, and it's it's you know, uh, there's there's some uh, stormy weather in China is the swine virus, uh, the swine outbreak, swine flu outbreak that the that's killed uh, a fair number of the. Uh, uh, the, the, the pork industry or has, has, has hurt the pork industry in China. So they have a need to import food. Uh, we expect that the phase one deal will, will allow China to import more food and, and, uh, and open those markets to American farmers. But, but certainly, uh, as we watch this coronavirus uh, outbreak unfold in China, it could have an impact on, on how, how big, at least in this current year, the uh, the purchases are, but I, I think over time the phase one deal is a great deal. There's protection for intellectual property, there's a, uh, commitments by the Chinese to reduce the deficit by buying additional American products, including agricultural products that you pointed out. Uh, so, so I think it's a great deal. I think it's going to be a very good deal for us down the road, but uh, it may not have as big of an immediate impact, like year one impact, as, as we had hoped because of the, uh, uh, the coronavirus. So President Trump in the State of the Union address said um, the relationship with China has never been better. And I'm sure many of you watch those remarks. I was then struck by a series of remarks in the past week and a half from other cabinet officials. Um, you heard from the Attorney General. Bill Barr just this week announced four members of the Chinese military have been charged in the hack of Equifax. You had the FBI director say there are over a thousand open cases against China regarding technology theft. You had the Secretary of State give an extraordinary speech on Saturday with a laundry list of basic exploitation by the Chinese government from everything he listed, the DC Metro, to uh, different uh, retirement and pension programs. That doesn't sound like the best relationship ever. Um, that certainly sounds like things are ramping up in tension in some ways, despite what you're talking about with the success in the phase one deal. So, so I think there are two different issues, Margaret, and, and for, if, if you haven't read the Secretary, Secretary Pompeo's speech to the governors that he gave on Saturday, download it, read it. It talks about the, the Chinese influence campaign across the United States in a way that I don't think has been done in one place uh, ever. It, it's a tour de force of a speech and, uh, and read it because the, the Chinese, and, and then if you, the, if you look at Bill Barr's presser, General Barr's presser, where he talks about the indictment of the, the Chinese hackers and, and what they were attempting to do and what they did do with respect to the personal uh, private uh, data of, of millions of Americans. Uh, it, it really gives you an insight. It, you know, if you like that hack, you're going to love Huawei running your 5G. And so uh, the Chinese are relentless. Uh, they're very capable. They're very skilled. And we are in a we are in competition with the Chinese. I mean, for for much of my lifetime, I, I've been writing about this for years, and I think it's now a bipartisan consensus. But uh, there was this idea that as China got richer, they would become more like us. They'd become more democratic. They'd be, they'd adhere to the rule of law, and, and this was a good thing for the world. Well, what's happened is China got richer, and they started investing that money into high tech military platforms, building a huge navy, building aircraft carriers, building hypersonic weapons, and they've engaged in a relentless campaign to continue to steal American intellectual property, continue to steal American uh, private personal data of American citizens that can later be used and manipulated in all kinds of fashion. Uh, so, so we are in, in a, uh, we didn't change, uh, uh, the, the, and the Chinese haven't changed. The Chinese are continuing to do what they've been doing for many years, exploiting the WTO, uh, uh, to get an unfair advantage against American companies. I mean, the, the, it's just a laundry list that goes on and on. Uh, taking the South China Sea, uh, drawing a cow's tongue around it or a nine-dash line, and, and treating it like it's some internal waters, like it's Lake Tahoe in California. Uh, you know, putting a million Uyghurs in re-education camps, and, and we're worried about them now as this outbreak of this corona outbreak takes place. You know, what's going to happen to the Uyghurs in the concentration camps? Uh, living in close quarters, are they going to get the medical treatment they need? Are they going to be able to? Are they going to be isolated from the spread of the virus? Has uh, it so spread there? Uh, we don't know, and uh, that we don't, you know we're not on the ground there. Uh, so so when you look at Chinese activity, this this malign activity has been taking place for a long time, and and mm. and we've known about it for a long time. We just haven't done anything about it. So we're standing up to the Chinese, and, and we're being firm with it. But at the same time, what the president has said is while they're a competitor. We, we can have a great relationship with China. You know, China's a great com country. They've got, a, they've got talented people. They're hardworking. Uh, there's no reason we can't have a good relationship with China. 
And, and I think the fa we've never had a, a deal like the phase one trade deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's a very positive sign. So you, know, you take the good with the bad, but I, I, I think the president is right that, uh, that we do have a great relationship with the Chinese, and especially on the trade front. Uh, the president has a very good uh, uh, working relationship with President Xi. Uh, we're offering to help uh, with the coronavirus when we evacuated some of our citizens from Wuhan. Uh, we sent over four 747s. Their, their cargo holds were full of, of medical supplies uh, sent by ordinary Americans, not by the government, sent by the uh, Franklin Graham Samaritan Purse, by the LDS Church out in Salt Lake, by uh, Catholic Charities, uh, sending, sending items to the Chinese people to let them know that we're, we're in solidarity with them during this very difficult time, public health crisis that they're going through. So, look, I think, we, I, I think we do have a better relationship with China, but I think it's also an honest relationship. And I think, you know, j just because China hasn't, hasn't stopped all their malign activity towards the United States, it doesn't mean that we can't have a good relationship with them. So, for analysts who looked at that and said, it looks like the Trump administration is ramping up pressure at a time when China may be vulnerable to some exertion of pressure. They'd be overanalyzing? Yeah, I think so. And I think the other thing about the Chinese, there's no let up in anything the Chinese are doing with the coronavirus. I mean, they're, they're still working to try and get, you know, the Chinese would like, I think they're trying to effectuate a takeover of the UN and all its specialized agencies. They're trying to have a Chinese uh, leader elected to all the, head all the specialized agencies. They're placing uh, they're, 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 they were working uh, this weekend. We were hoping that uh, Morocco would be the uh, home of the African CDC. China wanted in Ethiopia. They were very uh, active on that front. Uh, the Chinese have not, the Chinese continue to, uh, they launched a frigate the other day, uh, another modern missile frigate. So the, the Chinese aren't slowing down. The, the, the coronavirus is not slowing down the Chinese Communist Party from doing exactly what it wants to do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think we're ratcheting up any pressure. I don't think we're taking advantage of the situation. We're trying to help them, but at the same time, we're not going to silently uh, stand by while while this Chinese activity, whether it's hacking activity, and you know, look, probably everybody in this room has had their, uh, you know, especially anyone who's been in government has had every bit of personal, financial, medical, uh, personal information that you have uh, is likely on a computer uh, in China. To, and, to that and, point, I want to ask you because yeah. I read that Wall Street Journal front page story. Uh, just an hour or so ago that said, and you were quoted directly in it as having said that there is a backdoor Huawei can use to access information through telecom networks, basically directly countering what the UK said they had well under control. And this revelation cited to US intelligence comes right as Germany has to make a decision this week about letting Huawei in to their systems. Um, I'm going to guess the timing is is not just coincidental on the revelation, but tell me about that, the, the back door. What is it that you're saying is actually far more of a threat than our partners in the UK and elsewhere see? Well, I, I think the UK understands the threat. Well, they uh, think they, they, they can manage they, it. They think they can mitigate the threat. We don't think they can mitigate the threat, and that's a difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, because look, we're, we're moving into a new world with 5G. You're gonna have instantaneous downloading of data and instantaneous computing from your, de your device, whether it's a laptop or a handheld or a, a pad, uh, straight to the cloud. And whoever's between the cloud and your device is going to have access to everything that comes through. And with quantum computing and AI, it's going to be very difficult to encrypt uh, to avoid the, the folks in the middle uh, from, from uh, obtaining all the information that passes from the cloud down to your handheld. If you want to put Huawei uh, in there, uh, you know, I, people have told me that forget doing a phase two trade deal, forget about technology transfer agreements, forget about uh, patent uh, protection, those sorts of things, because if the Chinese control the system, they'll take everything that comes down, everything that goes up to the cloud through 5G. We don't think that's a good way to, uh, we don't think that's good for our country, we don't think it's good for our allies. And so we've been very pleased to see that uh, Japan uh, is, is only using trusted providers, Australia will only be using trusted providers, New Zealand. Poland, the Baltics, the Scandinavian countries. Uh, France has taken a very forward-leaning uh, position on only using trusted providers. Uh, I think the UK would like to see uh, some other market alternatives, and I think the folks at Dell and Microsoft and Qualcomm and uh, uh, Nokia Ericsson are working hard to make sure. I think we're ahead of the Chinese technology-wise. I think we're probably behind them uh, in having a commercially available system, you know, off-the-shelf mm -hmm. uh, system to purchase. But I think, I think the private sector will catch up uh, on that front. And, and I, I ultimately think that the UK will get to the right place, uh, and most governments will get to the right place. But look, there are going to be governments that can't afford to install 
5G kit. We have governments in Africa and Asia, other places, where the Chinese are going to come in and offer free 5G, and it's going to be too diff you know, that's going to be too tempting of a, or very reduced price 5G, and that's going to be too tempting of a, uh, of a gift to to turn down. It's just it comes with a, a, a price. Nothing, uh, nothing's free, and the the price will be that the Chinese will have access to all the data that moves to that network. What we'll have to do when we're interacting with those networks is to, to be, do everything we can to make sure that American, uh, 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 especially American uh, secret information is protected. You said in your prepared remarks that both Russia and China may be interested in some kind of arms control agreement in the months ahead. Um, have you heard from China that they actually are interested in taking up the offer of joining you know, New START or another kind of agreement? Yeah, so, so, so far, and this is not surprising, the Chinese are not interested in arms control because they're, they're again, relentless, they've got the money, and, and they're moving ahead very quickly on, on every type of, of advanced platform and weapon system uh, known to man, uh, whether it's space-based, cyber-based, uh, uh, all, all different types of kinetic uh, systems. And, and so they, you know, right now they're not interested. I think but, but Russia is interested and the United States is interested. President Trump is very concerned about no nuclear proliferation. We're very concerned about the danger that, uh, that the large nuclear stockpiles that, that Russia and the United States and China mm -hmm. uh, maintain for that matter. And, and I, th I think we're hopeful that uh, if we can move forward with, uh, with uh, some arms control negotiations with the Russians, that, that, that the Chinese will be, uh, uh, that there'll be pressure on the Chinese or, the, or there'll be a desire on the Chinese part uh, not to have to, to incur the expense uh, of an arms race that they would want to join in, in those efforts. We'll have to wait and see how that happens, but uh, I, I think they're also taking a look at the fact that the President's invested $2.2 .2 trillion over the past three years in modernizing and, and rebuilding the American military. And, you know, it, 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 as the Soviet Union found out, it's tough to have an arms race with the United States, although, frankly speaking and candidly speaking, the Chinese are better prepared to, to, to have an arms race and to, to do what they want than the, than the Russians ever were. On Syria, uh, before we go to audience questions, um, 600,000 people fleeing the city of Idlib. Yeah. And based on the UN estimates and projections, this looks like this could be the worst humanitarian disaster in what is one of the most brutal, bloody nine-year conflicts we've seen. Why isn't the Trump administration doing anything to intervene to stop that assault on Idlib? Yeah, so, so the idea that, the, that America uh, must do something uh, I, I just find that to be, uh, I, I don't even see that as being a real argument. So you've got Russian and Iranian and Syrian troops attacking Turks and, and their allies. Uh, and, and by the way, there are terrorists in Idlib as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and what are we supposed to do to stop that? We're supposed to parachute in as a global policeman and hold up a stop sign and say, stop this Turkey, stop this Russia, stop this Iran, stop this Syria. It I mean, sounds like we're, conversations we're, I had with the last administration. We're, you know, we're, we're, uh, 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 maybe, maybe it's, it, it, I think it's a little different. I think we have a little different approach from the last administration. I mean, we have a peace through strength approach. And, uh, and, and so, look, we, we, are, we decry what's happening in Lib and, and the, the, the refugee crisis has taken place in Syria. Uh, it's a terrible situation. Assad is a, is, is a very bad actor. Uh, the Iranians who are, who are in there up to their ears are terrible actors. Uh, the Russians aren't helping the situation, and the Turks aren't helping the situation. Uh, and, and, and we've made our position clear to all of them. Uh, well, look, we have a terrible refugee crisis that's taking place that's going below the radar in Venezuela. There, there are three to six million Venezuelans who've had to leave Venezuela because of the crushing, grinding poverty brought on by Maduro's socialism and, and his dictatorship. Uh, so, so there are a number of, of very difficult situations around the world. We're trying to do our best to ameliorate the problem for the, the folks there. We have, we have uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marine, marines in harm's way in, in parts of Syria uh, and, and lend, lending a helping hand to some of the folks on the ground there. Uh, but, but we are not in a position right now to, to stop you know, every, every single bad action by the Russians, by the, by the, the Iranians, uh, uh, by the Syrians or, or others. So uh, Idlib's a, a bad situation. We've made that very clear. We've made it very clear to the Russians that we don't like it. We've made it clear to the Turks that we don't like it. And uh, you know, we're, we're, but, but, but we don't have a, there's no magic wand to, to end that. And I don't think anyone in this country is prepared to send the 82nd Airborne into that uh, chaotic environment uh, uh, to try and uh, uh, solve another problem that, that, that's not of our making uh, in Syria. 
So we shouldn't expect the president to tweet about Idlib again? Look, I think the, the president was able to hold off. There was a, there was a, a serious risk to Idlib uh, about a year ago. And uh, with one tweet, the president was able to hold off uh, uh, an attack on Idlib for almost a year. And that created space for negotiations. It created space for the parties to talk. Uh, but President Erdogan and President Putin, who have a, an interesting relationship, sometimes they're best of friends, sometimes maybe they aren't. Uh, we were hoping that, you know, look, they, 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 it's really up to them to, to work that situation out. But, uh, you know, they, they, we, we bought them a year uh, with one tweet. That's pretty impressive. And, uh, and we're going to continue to decry uh, any sort of, uh, of attack on civilians uh, and civilian casualties and, and refugees uh, in Syria. It's been a terror, as you point out, it's been a horrific civil war. Uh, but, but I don't think we're going to intervene militarily in Idlib to try and, and straighten out that bad situation. We do have um, a packed room, and I'm sure a lot of questions, and there will be microphones run around to all of you. If you would, when you raise your hand, also say what organization you're from and identify yourself. This gentleman here. It's coming this way. Thank you very much. Uh, Voice of America, Russian Service. There will be two um, events in Europe this week. Actually, it starts tomorrow uh, related to strategic security. It's ministerial, defense ministerial NATO meeting. And then it will be Munich Conference of Security. What is the uh, priorities and, if you will, the message of the United States to participants of these two conferences? And another question to uh, follow up with question about start, new start. If China is not joining, and this treaty is between the United States and Russia, and it's, it will expire in a year, <coughs> what, when is the deadline for you to uh, define your position on start? Thank you. Thank, thank you. So with respect to, to participating at Munich, uh, unfortunately, I won't be there. I, I think a lot of folks in the room will be there. It's a, a great conference. Uh, we, we usually show up in force with a congressional delegation and also senior administration officials. I was there last year. Uh, it's a great place to have bilateral meetings. You can save a lot of travel by, uh, by seeing a lot, of, a lot of different folks on a lot of different issues in Munich. So uh, if you haven't been there, uh, you know, definitely make it a, put it on your list. It's, 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 uh, it, it's a very useful place for, for America to be. And I think by being there and being represented at a high level by our high-level congressional, bipartisan congressional delegations. I believe Secretary Pompeo will be at Munich. I believe Secretary Esper will be at, at Munich. Uh, it sends a message uh, to, to our friends and allies in Europe, but it also sends a message to our adversaries that America continues to be uh, uh, committed to Europe, that, that we're committed to the Western Alliance, that we're committed to NATO, and that, uh, that America is, uh, uh, plays an important role in the world stage. And so I, I think Participating in those sorts of conferences, whether it's Fairfax or, or, or Munich or others, is, is an important place for our senior policy uh, makers to be. And, and, and there will be a lot of, of business that's done on the sidelines uh, of Munich and in, in the bilat rooms. Uh, a, lot, a lot will get done. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll actually talk to each other a little bit more overseas than maybe we do here sometimes. So it's, uh, and, and you know, the, the administration officials don't like to go to the congressional delegation because they have better food and, uh, and, and are well stocked. And, uh, a better stock than we are, where we just got water. So, so it's it's a good it's a good chance for for a lot of business to get done. As far as new start goes, uh, uh, look, we're we are we will be negotiating with the the Russians on on nuclear armament issues and, and disarmament issues. Uh, and I think that's something that the Russians are interested in, that President Putin's interested in, something that President Trump is very interested in. We'll have to wait and see how those negotiations play out, uh, and we'll have to wait and see if there's a. Uh, uh, once the experts start taking a look at it, once, once any, any potential agreement takes shape, we'll have to see how uh, the issue of China plays into it. But we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get through that as part of the negotiating process, uh, but I don't think it's something we can predict now. Thank you. Uh, here on this side of the room, David Sanger. Um, Thank you, Mr. O'Brien, and thank you, uh, Margaret. I wanted to ask a little bit about Iran, uh, which uh, you haven't uh, gotten to uh, yet, at least on the, the nuclear program. Um, this summer, when they had a failed satellite launch, the president tweeted out, it wasn't us. Uh, the other day, they had another failed satellite launch, 
And uh, Secretary Pompeo turned out a statement saying we would never allow them to launch. Tell us what we should think uh, about that given the long history of, of U.S. efforts to sabotage those. And also give us your assessment given the very slow nature of their uh, of their buildup in, in recent times as they've gotten out of the restrictions of the JCPOA, how long do you think we have until they would have a significant nuclear capability that you would have to react to? So those are two great questions. I won't answer either of them. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, do, I do appreciate the effort, and uh, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't comment on, uh, on any of the programs that, or, or if even a program exists, uh, the type that you... Uh, uh, mentioned the first part of the question as part as part of, as far as the breakout issue uh, goes, uh, uh, probably can't comment on that either. But uh, what I can say is the president said in his recent uh, news conference uh, and the statement he read after we uh, had a military operation at the Baghdad airport uh, that, that Iran will not have a nuclear bomb, and uh, as long as President Trump is uh, is in office, I think we can everyone can rest assured that Iran will not have a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. um, here, can we? Sorry. Yeah. Here you go. Hi, Deb Brinkman with Associated Press. Uh, on Afghanistan, there appears to be some sort of a, a movement toward a uh, reduction in violence um, agreement between the Taliban and the United States. Um, how would you think that Trump is going to weigh that decision on whether or not to, you know, agree to that? How is he going to weigh that decision? Because last time, you know, he, he cancel the talks and how serious is this? Well, look, I think uh, Ambassador Kazilad has been doing a great job uh, out in the region. He's been in Kabul, he's been in Islamabad, he's been in Doha. Uh, he's been working very, very hard on this, this matter for, uh, for several years now and is a, a highly capable diplomat. He's working closely with uh, Secretary Pompeo, with uh, General Miller uh, on the ground. So, uh, you know, I, and a lot of progress has been made. Uh, we, I think we came close, the, the reports were close. I, I was not yet in this position, uh, but I had some interest in it because of, of some hostages that were being held uh, in Afghanistan uh, or, or uh, re possibly in Afghanistan uh, at, at the time. Uh, I believe the Taliban thought that they could obtain some leverage in some final stage negotiations by uh, engaging in a military operation that ended up with about 12 people being killed, including one American. And the president made that made it very clear that that is not the sort of thing that that impresses him, or that will give the uh, the other side leverage in negotiations. And so we we pulled out of those uh, those negotiations at the time. Uh, <clears throat> there were su subsequently a number of confidence building measures that took place, uh, so, and um, Ambassador Kazila and, and and others have been working and, and partners in the region have been working very hard on this. Uh, I think that we're making significant progress. It's something we're keeping the president apprised of on a very regular basis and, and we could have some, uh, yeah, you hate to make predictions when it, uh, when it comes to Afghanistan. Uh, I spent too much time working on the issue myself, but I'll, I'll say that we're cautiously optimistic that some good news could be, uh, uh, could be forthcoming uh, on, on that front. We'll have to see, but there, there'll have to be, a, the President's made it very clear, <coughs> excuse me, there'll have to be a reduction in violence and, and there will have to be a meaningful inter-Afghan uh, talks uh, for, for things to move forward. And, and if, if, if both those things and a number of other uh, uh, conditions are met and, and we can get agreement on them, I think we could have some good news coming out of Afghanistan. So we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see over the next several days and weeks. I think what Deb was asking about were some reports that there was uh, a possible uh, agreement to sign a promise to withdraw that Afghan and Taliban officials had been talking about. Is that on the table right now, signing yeah. such a yeah, pledge? Yeah, look, look there, 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 there's a, uh, uh, there are negotiations that would deal with, uh, with the expulsion or, or the, the, uh, uh, the uh, pledges by the Taliban not to, uh, to support terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS and, uh, and other uh, uh, malign organizations. Uh, and, uh, and, and look, the President's made it very clear that he would like to, uh, we've been in Afghanistan for 18, 19 years. He would like to get out of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, one of the toughest things the president has to do, and, uh, and I've been honored to accompany him on several occasions, including last night, is to go to Dover and, and uh, be there for the dignified transfer of uh, the remains of American heroes who have fallen. And, uh, 
and, and I've been to three of those uh, in the past couple months with, uh, with you know, great young men who were uh, uh, serving in Afghanistan, and, and the President's made it clear, and I think the American people want the United States. We've, we've contributed a, a tremendous amount of blood and treasure to, uh, to Afghanistan, but it's time for America to come home, but we want to come home under conditions that, are, uh, uh, that, that, that keep in place uh, protections for our colleagues and our partners in Afghanistan. And we want to make sure that uh, Afghanistan doesn't become a safe haven for, for terrorism again. So, so we're working <coughs> excuse me, very hard. Uh, our diplomats are working very hard. Our military is working very hard to put in place the conditions that would allow us to do that over time. But uh, I don't think there's any imminent withdrawal from Afghanistan. Another question on this side of the room, um, here in the third row. Yes. <coughs> Uh, thank you. I'm Sean Kim, a uh, uh, Washington correspondent of Seoul Broadcasting System. Uh, let me ask you a question about North Korea. Uh, yesterday, CNN reported President Trump doesn't want another summit before the election. Uh, however, you said uh, President Tr Trump uh, <coughs> told uh, Kim Jong Un uh, he want he wants resume talks. Does it include uh, two nations another summit? Thank you. Sure. Look, we, we've had a number of summits, uh, two summits and one meeting with uh, between President Trump and, Trump and uh, Chairman Kim. Uh, I think those have been very successful in reducing uh, the uh, the tensions that were that were escalating at the time that President Trump took office, and so uh, we were pleased with that. We've had a number of negotiations with the uh, uh, the North Koreans, uh, most recently uh, uh, this past November, December in in Oslo. <coughs> We'd like to see. Uh, negotiations continue if they're negotiations that that lead to North Korea honoring the commitment that Chairman Kim made in Singapore and the commitment he made in Singapore was to, to uh, commitment to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula we think that's fantastic for North Korea we think it's fantastic for for South Korea for the region uh, for Japan for China for, for all the countries in the region and it's great for the United States so so we want Chairman Kim to honor the commitment he made uh, we'll keep working at it and uh, you know, we'll have to see as to whether another summit uh, between the leaders is appropriate. But uh, President Trump has is, is made it very clear that if he can get a great deal for the American people, uh, he'll go to a summit, he'll go to a meeting, he'll talk to just about anybody. Uh, but we have to be able to get a good deal. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see how, uh, see if negotiations restart and, uh, and, and see what's on offer. Uh, but right now there's not a scheduled uh, summit, but if there was a, an opportunity to move the ball forward for for the American people, uh, he, he's always willing to do that. Whether it's, politi whether it's politically, you know, uh, or, or viewed to be politically expedient or not, uh, he, he's looking to, uh, to do things that, uh, <clears throat> that are good for the country. Okay. This gentleman here, um, there you go. right there. Uh, thank you. So this is Ping Ran with China Xinhua. So Mr. O'Brien, uh, what's your comment on the Philippines' decision to uh, terminate the, the visiting forces agreement yesterday and do you have confidence to save the agreement in the next six months and what's the impact to the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy? Thank you. Yeah, so another good question. We'll have to wait and see. I mean that, that's a, a relatively new decision and uh, we're in touch with our, our colleagues in the Philippines. We've had a, America's had a very long and storied history with the Philippines and uh, uh, I, I've had, I just had their state secretary visit me at the White House uh, last week. Uh, uh, we've had a number of uh, Philippine de uh, delegations come through the White House and come through the State Department. And uh, we have a lot of shared culture, a lot of shared history with the Philippines. And so, yeah, we, we want great relations with the Philippines and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll work at it to make sure that, uh, that those continue. At least we'll do our best. And, and, and look, a lot of things happen in, in politics and uh, we, we take those, those issues into account. And, uh, but but I, I think the, the, the shared relationship with the Philippines, the shared history with the Philippines, the shared culture with the Philippines uh, will, uh, will result in us re remaining a, uh, a strong partner of the Philippines. Like we're, we're there to help the Philippines. We don't want to be anywhere uh, that folks don't want us. And, and we've, been, we've been very effective in helping the, the Philippines with uh, insurgency, but also with humanitarian issues. And, and we're, we continue to stand by to be willing to assist them. So we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll see how this one plays out, but I'm, I, I'm confident in the long-term uh, stability of the relationship between the U.S. and the Philippines. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. We'll see how it plays out. Have President Trump and Duterte spoken since this happened? 
Uh, they have not spoken since this happened, but uh, wouldn't be surprised if they did soon. Okay, we have the gentleman on the aisle here. And then. Hugh Grindstaff, retired. <laughs> um, did, was King Abdullah consulted uh, on the Middle East peace plan? Yeah, so, so we consult with, uh, certainly with the Middle East Peace Plan, we consulted with, with all of our partners and our friends in the region. And uh, uh, some of those consultations take place publicly. And, and there were a lot of, uh, one of the great things about the peace plan <coughs> that was different than any peace plan I've ever seen it was the reaction of the Arabs, a number of the Arab states, uh, especially the Gulf states, that encouraged the Palestinians to sit down and negotiate over the peace plan. Uh, look, King, King Abdullah is in a difficult situation, uh, given the demography of uh, Jordan and and where he sits and, and his important role as the custodian of the holy sites on Temple Mount, uh, which, which are recognized and, and preserved in the peace plan. Uh, and, and we have, a, as, as everyone here knows, we have a very, very strong relationship with Jordan and with, with the king. Uh, you know, I, I think very highly of him personally uh, and have spent time with him and, uh, and the president has. And uh, so I, I think that Jordan will be one of the big winners if we're able to uh, achieve a, a lasting peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis. I think that's something that, that he'll eventually uh, support and the people of Jordan will benefit from. So uh, you know, we'll continue to consult with, with everyone, including the Jordanians, as we move forward in this process. Um, here on this side, uh, the young woman in the fourth row. I thank you, Yulia Olkhovska, Channel One Russia. I have a question on uh, START Treaty. Uh, actually, Russia have been ready to move forward with uh, START Treaty for a long time. President Putin told that he was ready to sign uh, to extend this treaty without any preconditions in the end of last year. So, what is your response? Are you ready to extend this treaty without any preconditions? And if not, what your conditions are? What will you bring to this negotiation table? Thank you. No, th th thank you. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think what we'd probably do is negotiate that with the, with the Russian government and President Putin and, and not do it in the press. So I don't think we'd get into conditions or that, that sort of thing in, in this uh, context or in this, in this forum. Uh, but I think, we'll, I think we'll be sitting down with our, our Russian uh, colleagues very soon and we'll be talking about those important issues. And uh, it's good to see that President Putin has made public statements and, and is uh, seems very committed to uh, uh, nuclear disarmament uh, talks, and, and President Trump is committed to those talks, and so I expect that uh, in the near future we'll be sitting down with our Russian, uh, uh, with Russian diplomats and, and, and talking about how those talks can be framed and, and then where we want to get as an end point in those talks. Uh, and and, and uh, the, the lodestar for that is always what makes America safer, and, and hopefully in, the, in this case what makes America safer makes Russia safer as well. Here in the third row on the aisle. Does that mean you're going to Russia in May? <laughs> As President Putin has invited. Yeah, thank you, Katie Wang with NTD TV. Uh, my question is, is want to follow up on the uh, coronavirus issue. Um, because we talked with many experts, and uh, some of them give he hearing, uh, uh, testified at the congressional hearing, they, also, they all said that uh, um, they are deeply concerned about that China remain very opaque in providing the, um, the information related to this virus, uh, such as the real uh, number of infectious cases and uh, the real number of death toll. So um, they think China remain um, uh, un underestimate on those numbers. So I'm wondering if you have similar concerns. If we couldn't rely, uh, we couldn't trust uh, their numbers, how can we fully cooperate with China to stop this uh, crisis. And also uh, regarding the supply chain, uh, because we know China uh, has such manufacturing uh, capability and uh, uh, important uh, uh, supplier of many, many parts of um, uh, manufacturing. So um, uh, do you have concern about this um, uh, crisis? Could <coughs> it impact the China's supply chain and impact the glo uh, American economy as well as the global economy? Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you. And, uh, Look, we don't have folks on the ground in China, and so uh, look, we're, we're, this is a, a very serious outbreak. The numbers are, are of, of infected and dead are very high. Uh, we're certainly concerned about the, those numbers. We're tracking them closely. Uh, we continue to work with with the Chinese on the virus. Look, this is a terrible. You know, 
we may be in competition with China, but there, there is, th this is a terrible, terrible thing that happened to the Chinese people uh, and potentially to people all over the world that this, this virus has, has broken out. And so we want to be helpful. We want to do everything we can to contain the virus in China. Our, our hearts and, and, uh, and prayers go out to the people of China that have lost loved ones, uh, uh, to the folks that to see some of the, the photos of, of people in the hospital, the suffering that they're going through. Uh, it's a it's a uh, it's a rough thing that China is going through, and our our prayers and our thoughts are with them, and our offer of assistance remains open to them. So, uh, you know, we'll monitor the situation closely, and uh, and we want to make sure we get the we get the information necessary for us to protect the American people, but we also want to do whatever we can to help the Chinese deal with this outbreak in in China. Uh, as far as the global supply chain go uh, chain goes, absolutely, China plays a, a critical role in the world economy. It's the second biggest economy in the world. Uh, my guess is, is that this virus will have some effect, uh, just like Boeing, uh, the, the problems at Boeing and the, the GM strike. There will be some effect on the, the U.S. GDP growth, which I think would have been much higher, uh, but for uh, th those three factors. So we'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see how it plays out and, uh, and whether uh, alternate suppliers can be found, whether the Chinese people, I think I saw in the news today, many people are going to, to work in the factories wearing hazmat suits and masks. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out, but it's something we're watching with real concern, and, and there's no doubt that the, the virus could have an impact on the U.S. economy and also on the world economy. Um, I have to get us out on time, but I would uh, be remiss if I didn't ask you, because I know you continue to watch what is going on with American hostages, given your prior role. Um, what can you tell us is being done about Austin Tice in Syria, about the at least five Americans still in detention in Iran? Yeah, so, so uh, Stephen was very kind in, in talking about how the, the president obtained the release of, of a large number of, of American hostages and detainees. And, and, and it was it, it's something that was, was not particularly popular uh, a, a, as a, uh, a foreign policy initiative because uh, you're dealing with individual people and individual families and there are these big geopolitical issues. So I think there's in the past there maybe have been a, a a willingness to shy away from using all the tools of American power to try and bring Americans who are wrongly held hostage, or wrongly held by uh, governments, or or held as hostage uh, home. And, and President Trump has has made it a top priority. And and as and as a result of his efforts, uh, a large number of people have come home. And I was really privileged to be involved. I don't I don't take any personal credit because in every single hostage case, there were different groups. Of French Marines, who in one case, uh, two of them lost their lives rescuing a, a group of hostages in the Sahel, or intelligence operatives from uh, Middle Eastern countries, or diplomats uh, uh, that helped us in, in, in various cases. Every one of those cases was different, but in every one of those cases, there was th th there were folks that that at you know uh, demonstrated significant courage to bring these hostages home, and it was always great to get the hostages home, and and, the, and it was always nice to. To bring them to the Oval Office, and I remember Danny Birch, uh, was an oil worker in uh, Texas who was uh, had been working in Yemen, had been held hostage, chained to a wall in a basement for almost two years, and he came back and was in, in great spirits for having gone through this ordeal. And the president asked him if he had anything to say, and he said, "It's great to be an American," and it was really a, a, a special moment. But but as great as those moments were, they were fleeting because your thoughts immediately turn to the folks that aren't home. It's it's great to get folks home, but they're now back with their family. They're they're reunited with their friends and their loved ones, and and you immediately you know start thinking again about who else is out there. And, and so, uh, I, I was like I was very honored that the president asked me to take this job. But it was you know it was hard to walk away from the last one. And one of the reasons is is as you mentioned Austin Tice. I've gotten to know Deb and Mark Tice. Uh, uh, well over the past few years, and they're, they're amazing people. I, I look forward to having the opportunity of meeting Austin. Uh, and, and, you know, look, we, we continue to assess that Austin is alive. Uh, we're doing, uh, we're, we're taking on, uh, undertaking efforts, I can't talk about them here, to, uh, uh, to recover Austin, but it's a, it, that's a very tough case. Uh, uh, in the case of the Americans who were held, uh, a number of them are dual citizens, uh, uh, but, but the folks that are held in Iran, I've gotten to be, I've gotten to know a, a number of their families personally, and uh, and there's nothing we would like more than to, to bring them home. And uh, uh, some of them are suffering from some very ill health right now. We'd like to get them out of, of Evan Jail or or out of home arrest and 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 reunite them with their families. We were very fortunate uh, in uh, uh, early December that uh, Xi Jiao Wang, a young uh, scholar from Princeton University. 
uh, that we were able to, to make arrangements to get him home to his, his wife and young son. Uh, but we, we, look, the work's not done until everyone's home. And uh, I continue to monitor. I, I, I can't do it with the, with the same level of, uh, of in intensity and same level of focus that I did because we've got a few other things on the plate. But we've got a great team in place. I think Secretary Pompeo is going to be announcing a new special envoy for hostage affairs uh, in the next uh, week or two. Uh, I've got a, we've got a great senior director at CT uh, at the NSC who's working this issue, and we've got some really dedicated folks uh, over at the FBI, <coughs> excuse me, at the Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell. So, the, you know, all the folks are in place. Uh, everyone's working hard to get the hostages home, and, and especially the ones that you mentioned, I, I, you know, there, there's nothing that would make me happier than to, to, to see them get back, and we'll, we'll keep working at it until, until we can get them reunited with their families. All right. We will leave it there. Thank you very much, Thank Ambassador Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you.